as we spend some time sharing about Mother's Day from this great example of a mother, the mother of Samson. We bless you in Jesus' name, amen. When you think of the great mothers in the Bible, Samson's mother doesn't come immediately to mind. But in reading through the Bible this year, I happened to come across this passage a few weeks before Mother's Day, and it struck me of some wonderful things. Judges chapter 13, 1 through 7 on your handout. I'm going to read that passage. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. Verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, as you read through this passage, and I encourage you to go back and read the whole chapter, this chapter and the next two or three uh, regarding Samson. Uh, some things about this particular mother that is very unique. First of all, she's, we don't know what her name is. She wasn't complaining to God. Nobody was praying that she would have a child. And yet, Manoah immediately after she runs to her husband in verse 7 and said, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink or anything, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb to this day. That's verse 7. And immediately Manoah said, Well, how come he didn't appear to me? So he prays and says, God, send the angel to me. I want to hear it firsthand, as if it wasn't good enough from his wife. This is a great, subtle passage. So he prays, and the angel shows up. But what does the angel do? He doesn't appear to Manoah. He appears to his wife again. So she immediately runs and goes, tell, goes and tells him. They come back, and the angel does talk to Manoah. If you look at letter A, uh, number two, under Manoah there, she immediately shares the news with her husband. But apparently this is not enough for him, and he prays to God, show us, teach us, God grants the prayer, but the messenger appears to the woman only. So there's more to the story. So under the whole story, when Manoah questions the messenger, he never receives as much information about the child as his wife does. He never hears of the prohibition against cutting the boy's hair or that Samson will begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. It is so irritating when God speaks to my wife and doesn't speak to me. I, I don't understand this passage. I almost didn't preach on it because I frankly don't like it that much. 
When your wife knows more about a situation because something was revealed by God to her and she chooses not to share it with you, what do you think of that? Maybe it's biblical. There are things when God reveals certain things to us that we treasure them in our heart. This passage is quite a parallel to the Virgin Mary and the messages that she got from the Lord. She treasured so many things in her heart, I'm sure she never shared them with anybody else. So the mystery of God's purpose is revealed through this passage, I think, in a very powerful way. I want to move to letter B, number one, a mother's covering. Samson's mother fulfilled the Nazarite vow when he did not. Now, I did not find this in any commentaries. I may be on thin ice, but this is the way I read the passage. Look at verse 4 on your handout. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink. Now, if my son, or if your son was going to, in the future, make a Nazarite vow, which were always voluntary, this is an involuntary Nazarite vow. How can you make a vow without voluntarily making the vow? God puts on this mother, Samson's mother, that from the very womb her child would fulfill or would carry a Nazarite vow. Because he, there's a special purpose for his life. Those of you that are mothers and even fathers, there are times in our lives, aren't there, when we have a sense that God is on that child in our womb. If you're a mother in your womb, if you're a father, you feel that sense of the Spirit. I know with our children, both of them, we felt that from the womb, God had something special for them. How about an angel showing up and telling you that your son or daughter in your womb is going to be very special. I think the challenge here is that what happens when that son or daughter doesn't walk in that vow, in that Nazarite commitment, never to touch an unclean thing, never to shave your hair, never to drink of strong drink, all of the different things that involve the Nazarite vow, it was like Samson set out to violate every one of them. If you've ever been a parent, you've probably experienced some level of grief at one time or another with your children or your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. That's part of life. But here is a situation where there's a great teaching in this. And the teaching is that the covering of a mother with a life of prayer for our children is maybe more powerful than anything else. I believe that Samson's mother took this vow seriously. She never drank. She never touched anything unclean. She lived the Nazarite vow that Samson did not. I find it absolutely amazing. Never giving up. Only she knew that her son would be used to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Over on the right, look at Judges 14, verse 3 and 4. Then his father... And his mother, just to set this up, he brings home the girl he wants to marry. 
If you've ever experienced that, when your daughter brings home the guy she wants to marry, and I have to be careful because my kids listen to this, uh, that sometimes you're not all that thrilled with the guy she brings home or the girl he brings home. Nobody's good enough or perfect enough for our kids, right? But some of them are just so out to lunch. You can't understand what they see in them. But, oh, Dad, I love him. He's so great. So, here Samson brings home someone or sees someone, verse 3. Then, the, then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me. I don't have to say a whole lot about that. I think you can read into that what it means. Verse 4, But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Look at number three under letter B. 14.4 makes it clear that she did not know what the exact reason for her son's marriage to a Philistine woman. She did know that he was to deliver Israel. Taken together it reveals a deep trust in God even when her son was disobedient to God. If you've ever lived through the experience of your children being totally disobedient to God, like I was totally disobedient to God, and yet you had faithful parents that prayed you through, that covered you, that cared for you, there is such a powerful thing in this. If you're in the congregation this morning, or listening to this, if you are a mother, one of the greatest things that you can do is to never give up on your kids. Why is that? Because God never gives up on them. And God never gives up on you. They did not know that which was prohibited by God to marry a Philistine. God said, don't intermarry. Don't marry outside of the faith. Outside of the Hebrew people. And yet in this instant, God was using it for his purpose. I can't figure that out. I never advise people to go against the will of God. But God's purposes can be filled, fulfilled even in the midst of disobedience. Even when somebody goes against the Lord. It would have been easy for Manoah and his wife to cry and bemoan. Oh, our son Samson. What are we going to do with him? And then over the next several years, everything they worried about came about. It got worse and worse and worse. Now we know that Manoah was dead when Samson pulled down the colonnade there and killed all of the people because he was buried in his father's grave in that same area. We don't know about his mother for sure if she was alive or not. I would like to think that his mother never gave up, continued to pray. This was not the kind of end result I'm sure that she planned. But this was God's purpose. If you dedicate your children to the Lord, moms and dads, 
especially moms, if you dedicate your children to God, I believe that his purposes will be fulfilled in them. Some of you know that I'm an adopted child. I found my birth mother when I was 40. We found each other. The year before we had started to look for each other, after 40 years, that both of us would start looking for each other on the same month was pretty spectacular. We found each other a year later. And it was an amazing thing to sit down with her for the very first time and find out a lot of the characteristics and traits that I had that she had. One of the very first things on the phone before I met her when we were talking on the phone for the first time and uh, I told she wanted to know what I did I said I'm a pastor of a church it was Calvary Chapel of San Peter at the time and uh, she said well I hope you're sitting down I have news for you and I said okay she said well you're Jewish well I jumped all over the place that was the greatest news I'd ever heard I'd always felt that I was Jewish, I had that internal kind of sense, you know. But the thing that struck out to me the most was to find out over the years, every time my birthday came up, she prayed for me. She prayed that one of her sons would become a minister. She kept a journal like I have kept a journal most of my life, and we compared journals on certain events that she prayed for me, I was going through some trial. And she prayed over and over that one of her sons would become a minister, and she named her other three sons Paul, Mark, and Peter. <laughs> How about that? Uh, the one she gave up for adoption, me, she didn't get to name. But she prayed for me anyway. She couldn't interfere. Now moms listen to this. I have to add this as a caveat to this message. Moms listen. My birth mother prayed for me and couldn't interfere in the direction of my life. Not that any mothers ever interfere with their children's direction of life or nudge them in a certain way. My adoptive mother was a Catholic who had left the Catholic Church disgruntled. She did the best with me that she could. My birth mother gave me up for adoption when she was 18. My adoptive mother adopted me when she was 41. Can you imagine being in your mid-50s with a teenager? I give my adoptive mom a lot of credit. I was a handful. My birth mother, though, kept praying that one of her sons would be the minister. The one that she had no control over, the one that was far removed from her was the one that God began to touch his heart and lead him in a direction to the very foot of the cross to receive Christ and eventually go into the ministry. You never give up praying for your kids. Whether there is broken heartedness, and many of you have broken hearts, I know, over different issues of life. Our God is a great God, is he not? Our God is a great God who will overshadow all of our devices, all of our plans, all of the things that we would try to make happen in the power of our flesh, God can make happen 
in the power of his spirit. Amen. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that uh, you would te touch each mother in the service today. That you would bless them, come upon them. I pray for every mother who has a broken heart over her children. That, Lord, that you would heal that broken heart. If those children are still alive, Lord, I pray that you would come upon that mom and cause her to, like Samson's mother, like my birth mother, to never give up, to pray right on through. Even though we would not understand it, we will trust in you for your purpose and your outcome. Lord, I pray that you bless each person in the sound of my voice. Everyone is a child. We are all born. We all grew up. We know what it means to be a son or a daughter. Not everybody knows what it means to be a mother or father, but we know what it means to be a son or a daughter. I pray, Father, that you would touch each of us, open our hearts to you, our Heavenly Father, that we might embrace the fullness of the mother heart and the father heart of God today. If you're here and you've never received Christ as your Savior, I invite you to open your heart and say, Oh, Lord, I come in to you now. I open my heart. I confess my sins. Lord, I receive you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand together.